It's good to see everybody here today. Uh, the weather is all over the place as normal for North Carolina, but um, I was ni it was nice to be able to put on short sleeves. I haven't switched out my closet yet, just in case, so I, I had a few of these still in the uh, closet to put on this morning. Um, we, uh, I'm glad everybody's here, and we... Um, have some announcements in your bulletin. If you'll take a look, there's in the they're in the front of the church. If you hadn't gotten one, are there any announcements that we want to bring special attention to? Uh, I will say uh, the first one is Christmas caroling. It's always a fun time, and then they have snacks afterwards at 6 p.m. when they return to the church. So that's on Friday. This coming up Friday. Uh, are there any other announcements that anybody wants to bring to our attention? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're our live online auction for the renovation team. We're doing a day three online auction that goes live on Friday until Sunday at 4 o'clock. Pickups on Monday the 11th. Um, it'll go out on our website, email, and it'll be Facebook. So if you want to share with someone in the community so we can raise some funds for our kitchen renovation. Okay, so how there's a live bake sale auction on starting on Friday, but how will you can you get? Just, it'll come through email or on Facebook, and you just click on it, and it'll come up view items, and it'll have what it bid starts at. It's increments of five dollars. There's cakes, there's some pies, there's cookies, okay. um, rolls, sausage cool. balls, sausage balls. <laughs> sausage Jeanette's. balls. Miss Jeanette's cake is going to be on there. <laughs> Okay. So you can use it any time during the year. Sausage balls, all, you can use it all year long. Okay. Until the coupons you have. Okay, so it's a link. <laughs> it's a link that'll come up. So check your email and Facebook uh, and the, or the church website. There's a, a link to this webpage. Yeah, so if you need a dessert for Christmas, there you go. You can put some of these cakes in the freezer and pull out at Christmas. Okay. So yeah, so keep an eye out for that. At, uh, fundraiser for our renovation team. That's exciting. Are there any others? If not, then um, we'll go into a time of prayer concerns and praise reports. I have a list from the adult Sunday school class that I wanted to read out. And if there's any others, please feel free to, to speak up and we'll, um, I'll say those out loud too. Jane Lindley, Pauline Andrew, Loy Thomas, Ronnie Lindley, Gary Davis, John Reese, Nancy Murkison, Vernon Harris, Ray Lamb, Ashley Silve, Katie Lindley, and Julie Causey, who are expectant mothers, and Hunter Causey. Are there any others that uh, any other prayer request or praise report you'd like to share with the church?
Fantastic. Okay, great. Thanks, Kendall, for that report. So her grandmother, Edna Fitzgerald, is doing much better. Are there any others? If not, let's, uh, let's all stand if you're able, and we'll have a prayer to open our service. Let's pray. Lord, on this Sunday, your special day, we come to you offering our worship and praise. Uh, we praise you for the many blessings in our lives. We help, hope that you will help us open our eyes and see those. We pray for healing and strength for those who have been mentioned in the prayer requests, those in the bulletin, and those that were mentioned in the adult Sunday school class. There's various needs, physical, spiritual, emotional, and you know all those needs, and you can speak to each of them. Thank you for the opportunity we have to bring them to you. And now we pray that you will be with us, be with us here in this time dedicated to you, to your worship. Help us to learn more about you, to feel your presence among us, to gain strength from that and courage. Open our minds and um, give us the insight into the word that's being shared with us by Daniel. And in all things, we pray that our actions will glorify you and bring glory to your kingdom. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all take our hymn books this morning and turn to page 145. Let's all join together as we sing Angels from the Realms of Glory. Good morning. I want to read a passage of scripture this morning as we continue our worship. And it's an interesting passage of scripture for a couple of reasons. It's in the Old Testament, I mean, it's in the New Testament, in the book of Romans, but it is entirely, except for the first three words, which is as it is written. 
sorry, four words. Uh, those four words are in the New Testament. Everything else is a quote from the Old Testament. It's, it's also interesting, there were times in the New Testament where people would go around and write compilations about different things. And so it's possible that this is one of those compilations put in the, the scripture. But uh, Paul is writing, and he's writing about the light and all things Jesus and the wonderful things. But he goes back just for a minute, like we talked about last time, the darkness that was there when we entered the world. So this is about the darkness, and it's all quoting from the Old Testament. And then, of course, the solution, which he says is, uh, Jesus is here and he's our salvation. We're justified by his grace, a gift through the redemption that's in Jesus Christ. But he says in verse 10 of chapter 3, as it is written, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat, this is, see, I think sometimes we, as a culture, we lower language, but this is really interesting. You know, we, we've dissolved kind of into to vulgarity and repetition and, and things like that, but this is colorful language that we might not be used to. He says, their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And in the paths are ruin and misery. And I thought, boy, that sounds a whole lot like watching the news today. And in the way of peace they have not known. And then this is the last kind of summation. There is no fear of God before their eyes. It is into that darkness that the light has shined. And so I want us to kind of read that as an introduction to the message and where it's going in a minute. Uh, we're going to enjoy a choir special right now.
going to have a time of open worship now. I'd encourage you, if God lays something on your heart to share, uh, feel free to do that uh, at this time. If not, we'll sit and reflect on the goodness of God. We started talking last week about uh, Christmas and about all things that are involved in Christmas and understanding that different people celebrate Christmas in different ways. And so we've talked about it in the sense of the light has come and Jesus is predicted to be the light and to come into this world. And yet, if you look around, there's plenty of darkness. What do we do with that? Well, I think it's obvious that even though Jesus came and he brought light with him, that not everybody chooses light. Not everybody chooses Jesus. Some people choose to remain in darkness. And as we dive into this series that we're doing for Christmas, we can more fully understand what it is that light means for us. And But what it exposes, light exposes things that are hidden in darkness. And uh, But people often don't, don't choose the light. And so we, we look at it in that way. We, we started in Isaiah chapter 9. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shone. And this famous passage in Isaiah is a prediction about God. It is a a prophecy about Jesus. It says, For unto us a child is born, but not just a child. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And we get things in Jesus like wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. But it introduces to us an element of who Jesus is that is not just light. Light, when it shines, exposes that Jesus is something else. What is that? It says, of the increase of his government and of peace there'll be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and hold it 
uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. One of the things that's interesting is that in the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem many years ago, not only was a baby born, but also a king. A king presented to us. What does it mean that Jesus is on the throne of David, that he is going to establish that, that he's over his kingdom? Even Jesus talks about his kingdom. If you want to go around calling yourself king, saying my kingdom is coming, (laughs) or my kingdom is at hand, or the kingdom that I'm going to rule over, it's a good way of doing that. What does it mean when it said Jesus is king? So we might have this picture. This is a... Uh, an idealized image uh, supposed to be Solomon's temple, supposed to be Solomon's throne. We have some indication in 1 Kings of what that looked like, and this is not it, so it's not a very good one, but I thought, oh, this is a nice kingly picture, right? A king has a throne, and a king rules, and a king might be seated on the throne, and the more prestige you have around you, the better. And so if you want to be the king of kings, or you want to elevate yourself among many kings, Maybe putting things around you that are solid gold and impressive to everybody so that when they come in, they'll be impressed. You can see, I don't know if you see the steps uh, heading up to the throne, have animals on each side. Uh, They're they're a little bit misrepresented because this one has different kinds of animals. It's hard to see in that little picture. You can see a little bit more in this one. And this is another, you know, people don't know exactly what it looked like. We didn't have a camera, uh, you know, when Solomon was around. But these are, are some, you can see the lion on one side, and you can see some other animals, gold plated, and they lead up to the throne. Uh, if you actually go back and look, it says in 1 Kings chapter 10, the king made a very uh, a great ivory throne, but if, as if ivory wasn't enough, he overlaid it with the finest gold. Then the throne had six steps. It's still the one seat. The seat had steps because the seat was elevated. The throne had a round top on each side of the seat were armrests, and then two lions standing beside the armrest with 12 lions stood there also, one on each end of either step. So six steps, the lions all the way up. And uh, we think that they were maybe even also gold-plated. Uh, but it said, the like of which never, was never made in any kingdom. So that maybe Solomon's was the most ornate. You think about gold everywhere. You think about this person. When you walk in and this is the person who's ruler of the land, it's meant to impress you meant maybe even a little bit to intimidate you, right? Who am I to question this person? This person's obviously uh, much more um, um, uh, established and much higher on the throne than than another one. And so, you know, you have to then submit, and that's the idea of it. There was a guy a long time ago, I'll tell you a quick story about a, a younger preacher, and he was in one of the Scandinavian countries in the 1800s, and he was going to preach in his church that day. And he got up and he had his sermon. He was getting ready to come to the church, and he received some pretty intimidating news. The king of the area was going to be in, the, uh, in church that day. Now, a young preacher often wants to be a people pleaser, right? Because that's a pretty good thing. If you can people please, you can keep your job and you can elevate your job. And so there's this thing. Do I want to please God or do I want to please people? And it's a hard thing for a lot of pastors to go through because we want to please the sheep that we're serving. But he said, hey, you know who I want to please? I want to please the king. The king's going to be here today, so let's impress the king. And so he threw out his sermon, right, which was about a a, a king, right, (laughs) the king, And he decided he was going to talk about all the great attributes of the great Christian king they had uh, who was going to be in the presence. So he stood up and he went on and on about how great the king was and how great a Christian he was and how great those Christian aspects were good for the the country. And at the end of the service, the king said nothing and got up and walked out and everybody else got up and walked out. And the pastor, kind of quite pleased with himself, decided to wait on his big reward for being such a loyal uh, pledge to the king and and how well he had made the king look in the the presence of the church that day. Well, several weeks later, a carton arrived. And the pastor said, all right, you know, this is my reward. I impressed the king. What kind of gift am I going to get? And I'm going to put this up and I'm going to tell everybody how how happy the king was. And he opened it, and in the box was a life-size crucifix. And in the box of the life-size crucifix were instructions to place it on the wall opposite of where the pastor was so that when he would speak, he would know from then on which king he ought to be preaching about and which king he ought not to be preaching about. And the king included these words about God and they were, you know, he said there are 256 names given in the Bible for the Lord Jesus Christ. I suppose this was because he was infinitely beyond all of that and any one name could ever express. 
So if you say, who is Jesus, you could say he is king. But there's 200 and some other things you could also say, but that doesn't mean he's not king. And there's an important thing that we need to realize, right? And that is that there are kings, and then there are kings of kings, right? In, in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, they're identifying Jesus, and they claim on him the title of king. But it's even more than that. They say, what, on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written. What is it? It's not just king, but king of kings. And it's not just Lord, but Lord of what? So the king in the Scandinavian country was trying to tell that pastor, look, I'm the king, but I'm not the king of kings. And there's time to say there's a wonderful king. You know, we don't have a king anymore, right? There's a time maybe you would say that if you have a king. But there's a time when we ought not be talking about kings, but the king of kings. So what is the difference in that time? How many of y'all are familiar with this game? What's it called? Family Feud. They ask 100 people on the street a question, right? Top four answers are on the board. When, <laughs> let me read the question. <laughs> when someone mentions the king, to whom might he or she be referring? What do you think of the top four answers? Ah, uh, come on. Oh, come on. Let's start at the bottom. The Burger King, two people said. Wow, we are impressed, aren't we? You know, just when you think, <laughs> what kind of shape is our country? And you read some of the answers on these things and you say, oh, now I understand. <laughs> so I guess being the king of burgers is okay. Three people said, and at least this has the right name in it, Martin Luther King Jr. At least his name is King, right? And so there's an overlap there. We've got three of those people. How many people do you think God or Jesus? Seven. Out of a hundred people, when people are saying the king, who are they talking about? Not the king of kings and lord of lords. And then, of course, the final answer you all know. How many people? Somebody call it out. It doesn't add up to a hundred. No, because some people said one thing and they don't put the ones on there. Top four answers, not all of the answers. <laughs> Somebody's like, I know this game better than you do. <laughs> 81 people, we're talking about Elvis. The king of rock and roll is higher on the list than the king of kings and lord of lords. At least Jesus beat out Burger King. When we say the king is coming, the king is coming. Do we recognize who Jesus is and what it means to be the king of kings? During this time when the king of kings is born into a manger, do we understand how that had the potential to change the world? Matthew chapter 2, we're going to read several verses in, in this passage. And in this passage, Matthew tells us a story. And he's the only one to tell the story. But it starts off like this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, we already know if we know the story, uh-oh, Herod's introduced, it's going to be bad. But Herod is who? King. Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born? King of the Jews. Right? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. So let me set the stage here. There's a king. He's a, he's a vicious, angry, nasty, violent king. Uh, he has killed, we know from history books, Herod uh, can't, killed people in his own court and people in his own family so that he could stay king and, and, and consolidate his absolute power. He, he is somebody who wants power and power alone, and he's not necessarily looking out for the people because there's uprisings all over the place. And these wise men from the east, literally the magi, right, decide to make a trek. They see a star. It pops up when Jesus is born, and they follow it around. When it said earlier that no one is seeking him, it was talking about, I think, people in Jerusalem. These people are from, they're outsiders, and they are actually seeking God, right? So the people who were waiting for Jesus, the only ones who were looking for him, weren't locals, they weren't from Israel. They weren't Jews. They were outsiders. It's an interesting passage of Scripture in that light. But they decide to go and they find that King Herod is sitting on his throne and they walk in. And they ask King Herod this wonderful question. Uh, King, King Herod, uh, you're sitting here on your little throne and that's all nice. Uh, I doubt you had a star when you were born. 
But the one who has been predicted, we saw his star. We've been looking for his star. And it finally stopped, stopped, you know, started up, and we saw it rise, and we're going to follow it anywhere. And so we thought we'd stand in your court and ask you a great question. You know what that great question is? Hey, king, where's the king? And it tells us something interesting. It says, when Herod heard this, <laughs> not Herod, it actually says Herod the king heard this, he was what? Troubled. Why was he troubled? How many kings can you have at one time? How many co-kings have we ever heard about in history? Right? One throne, one king over this area, and here are these wise men with their, their caravan. They're carrying all this gold. They're, they're bound to have a ton of people with them. They're coming in. All of our nativity sets uh, talk about three people or something like that, and you'll have three kings off. And so they probably had a caravan. These, if these people were wise men, imagine, they probably had servants. They probably had people with them. They were carrying all of the great gifts. There was a caravan. They, they made their way. It was a long journey. And they walk in, and they say, where's the actual king? And so what's Herod going to think? Herod's not going to be happy. He's going to be troubled, probably the biggest understatement in all of the Bible. But then it interesting tells us that all Jerusalem was troubled with him. Now, why would Jerusalem be troubled? Have you ever heard it said, when mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy? But take that and bring it to your kingdom. When the king's not happy, it's time to get troubled. When the king's troubled... It's going to trouble everybody else. Why? Because he's a nasty king. If he's not happy, he's going to take it out on somebody. And so all of a sudden you can see the fear and the rage in all of this building. This person does not want somebody to take over his throne. So after assembling all of the chief priests and the scribes and the people, he inquires of them where the Christ was to be born. I don't think that took a whole lot of time because it was clearly evidenced in the Old Testament. And so they said, um, you know, it's written uh, in Bethlehem of Judea. And this is why it's written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So all of a sudden King Herod's looking at it and said, wait a minute, this is, this is somebody who's going to come, this is going to happen. And so, some, you know, if, we, if we've heard the story, we kind of know the dark side of it. Herod summons the wise men secretly to, to see about what time the star had appeared because the star appeared when Jesus was born, as the story goes, right? This had to be sometime a little bit later, especially for a long journey. And then it said he sent them to Bethlehem saying, why don't you go search diligently for the child? And when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship. When you hear a king say he's going to bow down for another king, you might want to stop for a minute and wonder if he's one of the ones whose mouth is an open grave. Who's being deceitful? Who's lying? In whom we find darkness instead of light, right? Because it's not going to happen. So after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. This is a great story on so many levels because if we just wanted to follow the joy, it's there. But if we want to explain the darkness, it's also there. But it says, when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. This is one of the great passages of the scripture about the birth of Jesus. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. These are wise men. These are magi. These are important people in their civilizations. What did they do? fell down and worshipped him. They recognized the kingship of Jesus when people in his own land did not. Opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are not things we buy at our department stores today. Probably not a lot of people getting myrrh in their stocking this year, right? But in those times, those were very extra, extravagant, expensive things that were, were worthy of a king. Fragrances, and obviously the gold would have been important. But then being warned in a dream to, not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So it's interesting. They, they, how did God communicate with people? If, if you just stopped and said, wait a minute, how do people find out stuff from God? Well, we, you know, A lot of us would think, well, you read the Bible, and that's a good way. It doesn't say they read the Bible. Obviously, they knew that there was a king to be born, but they were looking into the stars. God used the stars. God used a dream. God used any number of ways to communicate. 
And then God uses another one because when they had departed, right, it's interesting that, that uh, they stayed placed for the time being, but after that, after the, this important rendezvous happened, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph, not, right, not the first time, in a dream, and said, what, rise and take the child as mother, flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So he takes the child and his mother by night and they departed Egypt. They departed quickly. They got out of there and they remained there. In, in, uh, a lot of people say during that time we have some evidence from other historical books that Alexandria, Egypt, was a place where a lot of people who got in trouble with Herod would leave to actually leave the province that, that Herod was in charge of. So maybe they, went to, maybe they went to Alexandria, but they were there evading the, until the death of Herod. We know the rest of the story. Herod decided uh, that, you know, that, that things were bad, but it says uh, this was fulfilled a prophecy. Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked, how do you think king, the king felt at this point? H- have you ever been in, in control of something, and then all of a sudden you're not in control? What do you do? You could let go of it. That's not often our first response. If I'm in control of something and I'm losing some control, I might take some pretty extraordinary steps to get control back. And what, what Herod did when he heard that, uh, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. And in all that region who was two years uh, old and younger, uh, according to the time that had been ascertained from the wise men. So Herod said, wait a minute, he, you know, he was born in the last two years. This passage of scripture where Herod called for the death of children is probably one of the darkest in the Bible. Do you know, and, and I mean, you know, so, so if we go back and look, and there's some people who try to figure out how many kids would that be. Uh, the, the, you know, Bethlehem was not, a, it was not a big place, it was a small place, even the surrounding area, maybe 20 to 30 children. It would have been a devastating act no matter what. But you know in that time, if you look at the history books and all, there are so many more evil things that this, uh, that happened in Bethlehem doesn't even get mentioned in any other history book. Matthew, that's it. Even though we would think about this as one of the most dark and evil things that you could do. In the world of Herod, <laughs> it wasn't that big. So for Herod, this was an, an afterthought. I want, to keep my, uh, I want to keep my power and I want to keep my throne. What's well, a few kids? We can see the darkness in that, right? We can see the, the, the evil in that. And so we skip ahead a little bit, and then when Joseph hears that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So he wants to go back into uh, Israel, but he doesn't want to go back necessarily to the place that he was staying before uh, he was. So being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and he went to the city of Nazareth. And so that was what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled that he was called a Nazarene. The question, I guess, at some point is, we get to this uh, uh, story and we wonder why, if all of the authors of the New Testament uh, had all of this material about the life of Jesus, why any particular story? Well, there's a lot of them that have a lot of significance, right? Uh, in fact, if you go back and look, there are some stories that are recorded in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000 would be one of them. So, okay, God's trying to tell us something there. There are stories that are only in one Gospel, in this particular one, in one Gospel. Why is Matthew wanting us to remember how Herod responded to something and, and this story about it? Why is it there? So I, I have this understanding, right? If you look at the stories in the, the, the nativity scene, particularly, we could go person by person. We've got one set up down here. And we could say, let's read the story about the shepherds. What can we learn from the shepherds? Well, when they heard this wonderful, great news, they got excited and they went and they worshiped and then they wanted to tell everybody what should happen. We should, at Christmas time, get excited and sing the, the great news and, and, and all of those things similar to the, to the shepherds. What about Joseph? Well, Joseph was in a bad position, but he believed God. Well, what about Mary? Mary was uh, young and naive, but remember when the angel said, uh, you know, that all of this stuff's going to happen and it's going to be scary? She said, whatever you said, may it be so. The amazing faith of young Mary. We could go to all of the other people. We could go to the wise men. Wise men still seek God, right? If you look for God, you can find Him. We can get a message from all of that. Even in this story, we find the wise men. How many of us, though, would ever find the analogy of ourselves. What should we learn from Herod? From Herod in this scripture, 
is there a message to those of us who are celebrating Christmas in 2023? I think there is, right? And so let me see if we can find something here. I think that the great issue in the story that we've just read is that when somebody's already king and they have power and they're a ruler, they don't really want the next one to come out, right? Jesus was not in that time claiming to be the political king. He, his disciples wanted him to be. He pushed them away every time he ran away when they said, why won't you just take power? Instead of riding in on a horse and being the valiant leader, he rode in on a donkey, right? And so, so all of these things, he was, he was favoring the weak side and not the strong side. There'll be another point about that in a minute, right? The present king never wants to give up power to a future king. One of the great threats of Christmas, Christmas is a heartwarming time of year, and it ought to be. Light came into darkness, it's heartwarming. But the nativity scene is actually a threat to all of us who are sitting here in that that little baby wasn't just born as a baby, that baby was born to be my king. Well, who's currently my king? Do we ever say, well, Herod didn't want to give up his power, and then say, wait a minute, the king of kings came. When do I give up my power? When do I let Jesus be king of my life? And some of the same issues are there. I think if we want to be in charge, you remember when um, in, in the, the, the narrative of the Garden of Eden, right? Adam and Eve are there, they're eating everything, and, and uh, God says uh, you can do everything you want except don't do one thing. What did their heart say for them to do? I want to do the thing that I've been told not to do. What, is, what, did that, what does that mean? Well, also the serpent said if you eat it, you'll be like God. They wanted to be like God because God is in control and they wanted to be like that. I think all of us have a heart that is rebellious at some point to anybody else taking over and that doesn't want to be told what to do. How many of you have ever had a two-year-old? How many of you have one now? That was the first hands that went up. What's the answer? You tell them what to do, what do they say? They don't just say no, right? It's that foot stomp. You've got to get that in there. No. The more firm I say it, the more, the more you're going to back off. Only parents don't back off, right? And so in our heart, when, when, when they said, so, so I was working at a camp one time, and we had an area we were adding on some bathrooms to some cabins. And so it was a construction site. We did not want the kids to go to the construction site. And so I left it alone. Because the construction site's not all that interesting, right? And we had nobody, none of the kids said anything about it. But somebody came along and said, that's not safe. We should put up tape telling everybody to keep out. And I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. In nicer words, because that person was my boss. And they said, put up the tape. We've got to protect ourselves. We're going to keep all the children out. So I put up tape that says, don't go near. Do not cross. Nothing to see here in bright yellow letters. What happened? The next week was middle school group, right? And before I could even head that way, we had 20 kids running over the sand piles and picking up all the tools. Why? In our hearts, we don't want to be told what to do. In our hearts, we don't want our neighbor to do it. We don't want our staff to do it. We don't want our, our spouse to do it. We don't want our kids. We don't want our parents. One of the hardest Ten Commandments is honor your father and mother because you've got to stop saying no to honor them and say yes. And we don't want to do it. Is there any truth to the idea that one of the best lessons in the nativity scene is from a person who wasn't in it? He's in the story, but nobody has an image of King Herod over here. But if the Bible is true about the darkness into which the light shone, the Bible is true about the human condition, uh, the, the condition of our human heart. That is, not that we want to go along with everything that Jesus said, but that we read some things and we say, nah, that's good enough for everybody else, but I don't want to do it. Do we not have a rebellious heart? Can we not learn anything from Herod? That in some way Herod is not just Herod, but Herod is a picture of my heart and the fact that I don't want to let go of control. Jesus didn't want to come and be a, uh, a baby. 
Jesus came, and when the light showed up, it showed that Jesus wasn't just a little baby, but he was a king. The king came in two different ways. If you look through the Bible, you'll find two patterns of kingship and the two comings of Jesus. So this one we're studying is Jesus coming as a little baby, and it, we call it Advent. Advent means coming or Christmas. And Jesus was foretold. There are prophecies that abound about the coming of Jesus. You know the Bible talks about a second coming of Jesus? And one of the easiest times for me to preach about the second coming of Jesus is the first coming, because the first coming is in many ways a pattern that affects the second coming. But here's the way it exists. We put this all in broad perspective, the big picture of the Bible. Jesus and God and all of those created the world and looked at it and said it was good, and they set loose the human, and the human heart was one of rebellion and one of pride and one of darkness, and they said, we want to do things our own way. We'll call that sin for now. At the end... If you read the book of Revelation, God says he's going to destroy darkness and destroy evil once for all, and then there's going to be heaven. If you read the book of Revelation, he doesn't come on a donkey, he comes on a, on a horse, and he comes with power. And he comes as God would come to set things right. In the middle of that story, though, so that we don't get destroyed when God destroyed darkness... Jesus coming the first time as a baby is one in weakness. It's not strength, but weakness. If you think about it, and I was reading this book by, by Timothy Keller, and he talks about this at great length, and there's a wonderful passage in here that I think is just really awesome. He says it this way. Uh, uh, I just want to read a quick passage. Uh, it's throughout the Bible. God doesn't bring his message through the Egyptians, the Romans, the Assyrians, or the Babylonians, but through the Jews who are a small nation, and a little race that's seldom in power. He dispatches Goliath, not with a big giant, but what? A little shepherd boy. You know, the one whom the giant laughed at. God works through small things. He's going to accomplish something big. He doesn't talk to Elijah through an earthquake and wind and fire, but through a still small voice. In the ancient times when the oldest son got all the wealth and the second one or younger ones got almost nothing and no social status, he worked through Abel, not Cain, through Isaac, not Ishmael, through Jacob, not Esau, through Ephraim, not Manasseh, through David, not his older brothers, any of them, right? At a time when women were valued for their beauty and fertility, God chose Sarah, not young Hagar. He chose Leah, not Rachel. He chose uh, Rebecca, who didn't have children, Hannah, who didn't have children, Samson's mother, who couldn't have children, Elizabeth, John the Baptist, mother, who couldn't have children. Why in the world? He says, I chose Nazareth. You know what happened when they told one of the disciples, Nathaniel in Acts chapter, you know what happened when they told him that Jesus was from Nazareth? He said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Every point, he's born in a stable. He had to run to a different country. He was born, he was raised in Nazareth. Everything about the story of Jesus, everything about the nativity. Who did they announce the birth of Christ to? All the kings in the area? No, they announced it to shepherds who were unfit to go into the temple and worship because they were unclean because they worked around animals all day. There's nothing about that nativity scene that says God was born in glory. That he was born and turned all the lights on and said, look, here I am, worship me. But every part of that story says Jesus was born for the least. Into poverty, into nothing, around people. He even says, if you do it for the least of these, you've done it for me. Because if, if salvation comes, Jesus wanted to show it was for everyone. Right? And he was born into that. To shine his light into that. So that you and I might choose him over darkness having a king over being our own king, so that at the second coming, when darkness is destroyed, right, when evil is gone forever and ever, when there's no sickness and no pain and no tears, God isn't destroying us with all of that. But he has made a way for us, a salvation for us, that we can be people of the light, that we can be children of God, that we can accept his message, the the message of Christmas is an invitation for us to pick God instead of darkness, to pick light instead of darkness, to pick good instead of evil, to pick the king of kings instead of the Burger King or the king of rock and roll or the king of any social movement. And so I would just ask us today, say, well, Daniel, this is some, some very tough stuff. 
Darkness is tough and we're living in it. And I think we need to get to the point where we're angry at it to see the benefit of the light. You say, well, Daniel, when you choose the light, you're giving up control. I'd rather Jesus, the King of kings who loves me and has died for my sins, be in charge of my life than continue to be a rebel and continue to want my own way, continue to be stubborn. But that option, that nativity scene, the option that it represents, the birth of Jesus Christ in the stable, isn't do you believe in a baby, it's do you believe in the King of kings? Do you want him to be your king? And that means one, one king on the throne. It means that I can't be my own king anymore. I am subject to, right? I am subject to. How hard is that lesson to hear today? Do we look for Jesus in the wrong place? There's one uh, piece of poetry in here I thought I would read. Where do we find Jesus? Seek not in the courts nor the palaces, nor the royal curtains draw, but search the stable, see your God extended on the straw. I say the Christmas story is confusing. I say it's hard to find Jesus in the midst of all of the stuff. But if we look for him, right, there's a star pointing us in the right direction. If we look, We'll find them. The question is, so there was a guy, he was doing a television show, he was debating an atheist. And the atheist says, I don't believe everybody believes in God. And the guy who was uh, hosting the show, he was a, a believer and he believed in God. And so at the end of the thing, he asked everybody in the, in the audience, he said, do you, any of y'all believe in God? And well over half, almost all of the people stood up, they believed in God. If we were to ask today who believed in God, I imagine in a Christian church, everybody would say, I believe in God. That's almost a different question. It is not, do we believe in a king or a God? But do we believe in one particular one that the Bible sometimes tells us has ideas that are not ours? That the Bible says wants to rule over us, right? Not just be. What a friend we have in Jesus. King isn't the only word. Friend, child, you know, wonderful counselor. There are so many words. That, but one of them is king. If we saw Jesus today, would we say to Jesus, all right, get in line, I've got some stuff I want you to do, so when I pray, you're going to do exactly what I say, right? Follow me around and be a good God. Or would we fall at his feet and look up and just say, wow, King Jesus. And then maybe our prayers are not, God, give me what I want, or God, what do you want, as Jesus said. Not my will be done, but yours. Or in his prayer, be, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That if we saw King Jesus, what would our response be today? To me, it's hard to say because there are parts of my life I still want to be king over. There are parts of my experience in this world I still want to have a say over. Have I submitted to the King of Kings? Or am I just treating Jesus as one of maybe, maybe seven out of a hundred? <laughs> Let's stand for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, it didn't go long before this baby, born in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes, started getting a little pushy. Started demanding more of my life. But maybe I misunderstood when he was born that he wasn't just born a baby, he was a king. Maybe he's not just a king, but he's the king of kings. And Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. Because in the darkness of my heart, in the rebellious of my heart, I need not just a baby. I need a king. King of kings and Lord of lords. I submit. Take my life. Don't let me be king anymore, but be my king. I'll praise you forever. All of these things I pray in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our precious Savior, but also King of kings. And all God's people said, Amen. We're dismissed.